Namaskar and welcome to In Focus. The topic this week is the Broadcast Bill and amongst the many issues it raises, perhaps the central one is to what extent will it control what we've got used to seeing and hearing on television. Here to address that issue is the new Minister of Information and Broadcasting and spokesman for the United Front, Jaipal Reddy. Mr. Reddy, let's try and first establish what the first principles are that lie behind the broadcast bill that's now been circulating in Parliament. What would you say is the central purpose of this bill? The central purpose of the bill is to fill up the legislative vacuum that stares in the face of the nation. We have had foreign television channels, beaming programs from outside the country for five, six years. In within the country, we have not given similar freedom to Indian players. So the purpose is to facilitate the Indian players to do their programs and to permit the foreign players through certain regulatory framework. All the leading democracies in the world have enacted their own broadcasting laws. India should have done it long term back. There are two strands in what you are saying to me. On the one hand, you are creating, in a sense, a level playing field between Indians and foreigners. On the other hand, you are also regulating. When you say regulating, are you simply regulating the use of airwaves, or are you also looking for some way to control the nature of the broadcasting? The broadcasting authority will have this power. The government will not have the power. But the authority will have the power to control, affect, change whatever is broadcast. The word control, I'm afraid, uh, current is not the correct thing to use. It is regulation. We have certain code by which it will regulate. I suppose the problem with the word regulation is that it all hinges upon the intention behind the regulation. And I know that your intention would always be an honorable one. But let me for form's sake ask you the question, would you support any measures, whether in the bill or whether suggested as amendments to the bill, that would seem to control and thus diminish freedom of speech or expression? I will not support any provision which is designed to or which can enable anybody to control the program. So you want to preserve editorial independence? Yes, absolutely. And when you say you won't support any measure, are you talking about both direct measures and indirect measures? Yes. So this is categoric? Th that is categoric. Then let me explore with you to get your reaction to certain clauses in the draft bill that's been circulated and people have been writing about and speaking about because they tend to worry us. For instance, there's clause 13.3, which says that in order to achieve its objective, the Broadcast Authority of India can, and I quote, consider and improve a mixture of different kinds of programs in a licensed service. What do you mean by that? The point is a channel cannot cater to only one kind of program. It's pleading for certain minimal diversity. It's more a guideline. But why? Surely proprietors or directors of programs of channels have a right to decide whether they want to be a mass market or a niche market channel, whether they want to be a general entertainment channel or a specialist channel. You're requiring them to be one type and not giving them the choice to be what they want to be. Firstly, I should clarify, none of these provisions is sacrosanct. So this could change? This could change. But the change will have to be effected by the all-party parliament committee to which it is getting referred. Are you also therefore saying that express some of these concerns to the committee because when the committee expresses it back to you, you will be willing to listen? No, the committee will be able to decide. It does not have to go by the will of the minister. Okay, then in that case, let me bring up another clause, which perhaps is a shade more worrying. 
It's clause 13.5, and it says, the authority shall, and I quote, have power to inspect and obtain information from program producers. And it doesn't specify any limits or any conditions. Now, that sounds worrying. I don't think it should cause any worry whatsoever. All the interests or viewpoints will be allowed to be represented freely and fully before the all-party parliament comes. But you see, Mr. Reddy, if this clause survives the way it's been incorporated at the moment, it could be used to arm twist journalists. It could be used to enter newspaper offices and demand, ac demand access to sources. It could be used to reveal sources. Uh, this has something to do only with the electronic media. Nothing to do with the print media. Absolutely. So why have you allowed this sort of inspection in the electronic media when clearly you would not even permit it in the print See, media? This entire bill framework was prepared before I took on as information minister. So it's been sent to the parliament committee. It's nothing more than a working draft. Nothing is said. So all of this could go? No, anything could go, anything could be added. The In fact, we have borrowed a lot from the broadcasting laws of Western countries. Let me, let me put it like this. As you hear me bring up these clauses, I get the feeling that you're seeing behind my question an interpretation that you perhaps hadn't recognized. Does that interpretation worry you? I think if that is the interpretation, it would worry me. And therefore, that would never be the intention of the government. And therefore, if you find that there are many others like me who share this interpretation, you will be moved perhaps to amend the clause. I will not play a big part in this process. It is the parliament committee that will play a big part. And the leading members of all parties will be represented on this committee. Therefore, I am sure if there are genuine concerns, they can be articulated powerfully before the committee. And the committee will have the entire freedom to mend, amend, or end any provision. And no element of ministerial pride or prestige will come in the way. Absolutely. Then let me pursue this slightly differently. As you know, Mr. Reddy, there are many ways of controlling a channel. One is to do it directly. The other is to so restrict its ability to compete that you end up tying its hands behind its back. Now, Clause 23, as it stands, says, and again, I want to quote, it says, no broadcaster will be permitted exclusive rights for live broadcast of certain sporting or other events of international interest held in India, unless the public service broadcaster has also acquired the domestic right for the same. Why? You see, when I took over, this already became a framework. When my intention was not to pass the bill as it is, but to get it scrutinized by a powerful all-party parliament committee. But Mr. Reddy, if so much of the bill can be revised by the committee, if so much of the bill, to use your words, needs to be scrutinized, then are you also not saying that perhaps as it stands, it's not well drafted? No, I don't agree. See, in any broadcasting law, you would find such provisions. Because, you know, these are all considered saving provisions but consider they can't be, they can't be used uh, arbitrarily but please the courts for, can intervene forgive me considered this provision can't be because this provision if it comes into law would disallow the existence of channels like espn and star sports because they survive on exclusive rights of cricket matches held in india which they have justifiably and legally acquired and the supreme court has supported it now they wouldn't be allowed to show it unless they share it with Dudarshan. All such affected parties will be given full hearing by the Parliament Committee. The Parliament Committee can be persuaded to modify some of these provisions if necessary. I know that if I go back to my question, in a sense, I'm tempting you to criticize your predecessors, so I won't do that. 
But once again, it seems to me that you are not identifying yourself with this draft bill at all. You're distancing yourself from it. Because I don't want to take positions on various provisions of the bill. I want to approach a subject with an open mind. It's a virgin field with a never changing technology. So we need to marry our national ideology with a, a technology that's subject to rapid rate of obsolescence. No doubt, but you still expect the Minister of Information and Broadcasting to circulate a bill, which in due course I assume will also be tabled, that he stands by and supports. Your connection with the bill is to say, this is just a draft, change it as you want. I have no pride in the changing of it. I'm quite happy to change anything. Nothing is sacrosanct. It really does suggest that you're saying, this is a very poor starting effort. No. The point is, we are all struggling to produce a draft. Nobody expressed concern when there was a legislative action. Can I be, not, can I be naughty for a second? Mm. Suppose you had to struggle ab initio. Would you have produced a better initial draft if it was yours? No, I wouldn't say that. Because that would be... You wouldn't or you couldn't? Uh, or you shouldn't? Uh, 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 see, that would be taking too much care for myself. You see, all of us should pull our heads together and produce as good a piece of law as possible. I want to keep an open mind. My position is, I will not take a position. All right. That's a very interesting position for a minister to take. I won't take a position on a bill that I'm going to be tabling in parliament in due course, and yet I'm not going to say that I see things wrong with the bill that I won't take a position on. No. It, it's uh, like... Uh, 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 Karan, of course, uh, you have a right to be uncharitable. I don't deny <laughs> that right. But the point is, when the bill is being referred to a parliament committee, why should I prejudice the debate or discussion by the Parliament Committee? Okay, then let me raise one other I issue. would like to tell my colleagues of Parliament, who are, uh, some of whom will be as senior as myself, not more senior, that uh, I am open to their suggestions. Okay, let me then give you another suggestion and see how open you are to it. We're talking about the central concern about control. And there's a lot in the bill that you said is not sacrosanct, so let's assume it'll all change and those concerns don't apply. But there is one other area of concern, and that's the makeup of the broadcasting authority that will be set up. As the draft seems to stand, it's going to consist of at least three secretaries to the government of India as, as ex officio members, and the Home Ministry seems to want the Home Secretary added to the list. That doesn't sound right, does it? I can tell you one thing in principle. We do not want the broadcasting authority to be dominated by bureaucrats. So you don't want so many ex officio members? I have stated in terms of general principles. Then one other thing, as the bill exists at the moment, it says that the secretary general, who is going to end up being the chief executive of the authority, is to be drawn from one of the many secretaries to the government of India. Now that worries people. Why do you want it to be chosen from that lot? That has been slightly changed. It, it has to be drawn from the panel of secretaries. We, we, we need an experienced bureaucrat. But the choice will be made by the authority. But why do you need an experienced bureaucrat? That's the precise point. Why do you need it to be chosen from a panel of secretaries? The panel of people who work as secretaries. Because, you know, he, he will not be the chief of the organization. The chief will be the chairman. But he's the chief executive. Chief executive. He's, he's only to carry out the instructions of the authority. But why should and this... And the chairman. But why should this person who's in very close day-to-day -day control not be drawn from the no, 95 he, crore people outside the uh, panel of secretaries? Uh, true, but the point here is, once he goes over to the authority, he has nothing to do with the government of India. He's going to the authority on deputation, not forever. He's not tying himself off. No, I, I, that I think will be the position. You will ensure it is the position. Yeah. So you but will ensure... Any person who goes away from government of India to authority for five years 
uh, he will retire there. If his, if he, his, he will have no lean on government. As of long India. as his career graph and his structure of future employment doesn't depend upon the favor of the government of India. Well, surely. The basic point I'm making no, is. No, no, I'm telling you, I'll give you a parallel. Government, secretaries to government of India go as members of the UPSC. They never return to the government and leave. Let me give you another parallel. The press commission, the press council, works as a very effective independent body, even though the head is appointed by the government. Will your broadcast authority be equivalent? Yes. Uh, it will be even more independent than the press council. And you will personally you. strive to ensure it is? I, I, it shall be my strong, consistent, sincere endeavor to ensure its independence, not only through law, but through proper implementation of the law. Since you, Mr. Jeff, already put it so strongly, everyone will believe you. There we have to take a break, but I want to continue this discussion in part two. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to our interview with Jaipal Reddy. Mr. Reddy, in part two, I want to talk to you as both spokesman of the United Front and also as a Janata Dal minister. Why is Lalu Prashad Yadav being treated differently to either Bomai or Sharad Yadav? Mr. Lalu Yadav is the chief minister of a state, the president of a national party. Apart from that, is also arguably the most powerful mass leader in our party. But all these positions cannot save him or us from a legal process. So the law will take its course. Uh, but uh, in the case of Lalu Yadav, quite a few people are jumping to conclusions. It's not the law taking its course that I'm questioning. It's not even jumping to conclusions. It's how you behave when you're a senior politician in the situation he finds himself in. In 1996, 17 Congress ministers, I think that's the right number, resigned in anticipation of being charged cheated. Now that the CBI has officially made it clear that they are seeking permission for Mr. Yadav to be charged cheated, why isn't he stepping down? Mr. Yadav is chief minister of a state. He's not under a prime minister. We are living in a federal system. The CBI has approached the governor. The matter is under consideration of the governor. We cannot substitute our judgment for the judgment of the governor. We'll have to watch out the process. You know the wonderful phrase, Caesar's wife should be above suspicion. Shouldn't Caesar be above suspicion as well? I agree with you um, in terms of general principles. And this Caesar is under suspicion. Well, uh, 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 obviously, Mr. Lalu Yadav doesn't share your perception. Are you therefore saying that in a federal system, where he is chief minister of a major state and also president of a party, he takes his own decisions? No. He is chief minister of a state. Legally, that's very important. So until the governor takes a view, none of us can intervene. You're being a little technical, aren't you, Mr. Reddy? I'm not talking about law. I'm talking about norm. I'm talking about democratic decorum. Surely, when a person in this high position, and he's in two high positions, has the CBI officially wanting to charge, cheat him, you step down to show that the system's clean. It's not a sign of guilt stepping down. It's the correct decorous behavior. Don't you agree with that? I think, uh, you know, we are trying to form opinions in the midst of the process. Can there be two opinions about what's the right way to behave? What's the proper thing to do? I don't think there's scope for two opinions. Quite but, right. But we need to wait for completion of the process. Do we need to wait for completion of the process because that would be the proper thing to do? or? Because you know this gentleman's not going to step down and he's embarrassing you, and it's just a very effective thing to say. No, the point is, we are in a vast country, and therefore we have a federal system. 
if it is a matter relating to union minister, the prime minister can act immediately. If it is a matter relating to chief minister, there are other constitutional authorities. You, have, you may have noted that the prime minister has chosen not to meet the governor of Bihar. In other words, the prime, new prime minister, Mr. Gujral, is trying to restore the credibility of some of these constitutional institutions. Is the chief minister of Bihar acting in a way as to restore the credibility of the chief ministership or the presidentship of the Janata Dal? Answer me that. The point is, I will not prematurely pronounce my opinions. The chief minister of Bihar is on record as saying that even if he is charged sheeted, he won't resign. And if need be, he'll rule from jail. Do you approve of a chief minister and your party president adopting this attitude? See, we don't in politics react to every single statement. Oh, yes, you do. You do it all the time. That's no, what no, parliament's no, no, there no, for. No, true, true. But so long as the law of the land is not violated, we shouldn't get unduly disturbed by statements. Oh, we shouldn't get unduly disturbed unless the law of the land is violated. Then tell me, do you remember the urea scam, the sugar scam, the security scam, the BOFA scam? They were endless scams. You were in opposition. You were baying for the blood of ministers and prime ministers. There was no proof. Even the process of the charge sheet hadn't started. Here, the CBI wants to charge sheet the man. He's refusing to step down. In all these cases, you referred to, I was in the forefront. I pled guilty. But I produce evidence on my own, whether it was telecom scam or sugar scam and so on and so forth. I produced documentary evidence. So we, we were asking for investigation. The CBI's produced documentary evidence, 300 pages of it. Def, that is being processed by the governor. Why do you want to preempt the role of the governor? I don't want to preempt the role of the governor at all. See, as, as, as a central I cabinet want, minister, I simply want a, to. As central cabinet minister, I do not want to preempt the role that's assigned to the governor in our country. Let me change the question, and it's my last question. If you were in Lalu Prashad Yadav's shoes today in his position, would you step down or would you wait for the governor to give his answer or would you wait for something else? Just answer that. That's a hypothetical no, question. There's nothing wrong with a hypothetical question. If you were in his shoes, would you step down? Uh, see, each, it's your political uh, morality. Uh, everybody has his own approach to problems. It's your approach I want to know. If you were there, would you step down? See, I don't want to adopt this holier-than-thou attitude. You're not. You're not being holier-than-thou. You're just uh, telling uh, me what it, you do. It, it would be very easy for me to say I would act differently. But that would be uh, sounding sanctimonious. You're not saying that you wouldn't act differently. Well, it's for you to interpret. <laughs> I think everyone will interpret it with that smile on your face. <laughs> Mr. Jaipal Reddy, thank you very much for having given us this interview. It's, it has been my pleasure, too. That's it for this week. And next week, we'll be back with another interviewee. But for today, from the residence of Mr. Jaipal Reddy in New Delhi, goodbye.